Isn't God good? Amen. Well, good evening and welcome back to Wednesday Night Bible Study. We are back in the book of Galatians. Colossians, yes. I'm just hoping somebody pays attention. I'm so, I'm so glad. Y'all are awesome. We are in uh, Ephesians, Colossians. We're in Colossians, so if somebody's keeping track. We are back in the book of Colossians, and we've already covered some of our context. We are in the back half, well, actually, sort of toward the beginning of chapter 2. And we're going to pick up there tonight, but we're going to pray one more time. You know what we normally do. Get a hold of your Bible. Go ahead and get a hold of your Bible. We're going to pray, and we're going to ask God to... Open us up, ask God to uh, help us relinquish control and submit to his word tonight. Can we do that? God, this is your word. This is your living word. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it cuts through anything, God. It cuts through all the lies of the enemy. And Lord, it cuts things out of us that shouldn't be there. So God, I pray tonight that we open ourselves up to your word, that it can be a light to our path, a lamp unto our feet, just like it says. But Lord, help us to surrender to whatever is taught from this book tonight. We give you all the glory, all the honor and praise. It's in your name. Everybody says, amen, amen. amen. Well, uh, like I said a moment ago, we got our context from a few weeks ago. And we know what's going on, sort of. The Apostle Paul is writing to a church he's never been to before. We covered that. Because it has been reported by a guy named Epaphras, I'm probably mispronouncing that, but that's how I read it, that the Colossian church is experiencing cultural pressures. So we, we all got this. The, the church in Colossae is under extreme pressure to either A, turn from their faith, or B, compromise on their faith. And Paul has heard this, and Paul is trying to write them a letter, even though he's never been there, trying to encourage them. So they are reported to have a strong uh, faith, but they're still under pressure. So what other things? Uh, what are the other things that they're being pressured to? Well, just give you some context, because that's what we get to check out tonight. We get to check out the, the we, get, we have four uh, subsections to the letter, and we're in the section that deals with the pressure Paul addresses it directly. So they're being pressured by culture, the Colossae culture, uh, Colossian culture, there we go, to worship Greek and Roman gods. And these are gods that, it's just so familiar. These are false gods, idols. And the whole culture is obsessed with all these false gods. So just a few, Hermes, the god of money, they called him. Apollo, the god of music. Aphrodite, the goddess of sex. And they all worship these gods, and this is not anything relative to Jewish culture. This is just non-Jews, regular people in Colossae, uh, and they're worshiping all these Greek and Roman gods. Now, it's worth noting that they, they're not really upset with the new, the new good news on the scene. They're not upset with the Christians introducing the gospel. Matter of fact, as the good news of Jesus is introduced into Colossian culture, the culture isn't upset at all. In fact, the only thing they're upset about with the introduction of, introduction of Jesus is that Jesus says he's the only way, <laughs> that he is the one true God. And it's being taught that no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. And suddenly the Colossian culture is, they're upset about that piece. They, the culture just wants them to add Jesus to their mix of gods that they worship. Imagine a courtyard. Imagine a big courtyard filled with statues of all kinds of different gods. They're like, you can bring Jesus in too. We'll just have Jesus with these. And of course, we all know how that went over with Paul and how all that went over with the Christians. They were like, no, it's Jesus or nothing. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to, you know, they're, they're quoting scripture. They're quoting Jesus. It's not scripture yet, but Jesus said it and they knew it. And Paul is here to encourage them. Paul writes them a letter. He's on house arrest. He writes them a letter and says, don't you give in to that. Don't you turn away. Don't compromise on your faith. There's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. And this is what's going on primarily. But to make matters worse, you remember when we studied Galatians, the main problem was that the Jews, non-Christian Jews, were trying to force baby Christians, people fresh in their faith, to follow the law of Moses. Guess what? That's happening here too. So we have pressure from the world to follow all these 
false gods, but we also have pressure in Colossae from the Jews who were trying to tell people, you need to follow the law of Moses. So that's going on as well. So a lot of pressure here. And here's Paul's method to writing to them. He hasn't met them before, so he takes this passive-aggressive writing approach. He talks like they already know what he's saying. Like, you already know this, but let me say it just in case you don't. That's the approach he takes. And in the writing, he starts out with Jesus as the exalted Messiah. Great place to start. Jesus is the exalted Messiah, the one true God. And that's important, because just like I told you the last few weeks when we did the study, the whole letter is kind of read through that lens. Chapter 1 is the lens for which you want to view the rest of the letter. So, after closing chapter 1 and starting into 2, he talks about himself. Paul points to Jesus. He's the Messiah. No one except Jesus is God. There are no other gods, just Jesus. He explains that. Then he talks about how he has suffered for Christ. Explaining how suffering for Jesus is a joy, an honor, because it is proof. In their culture, it exposed that he was successful at representing Christ. Think about it. Everyone knows how that culture, the same culture Paul's living in, Everyone knows how that culture treated Jesus. And Paul is, Paul is in the same culture, so to be treated even remotely like Jesus means you're doing it right. <laughs> so he's happy to be suffering for Christ. And to be honest, we're not far off from that same point today. But now we have reached the third subsection of the letter where Paul addresses this pressure. So let's try to jump in. Here we go. Chapter 2, ver two verse 6. Paul has just finished his point about how he suffered for Christ. And Paul, while under house arrest, he's setting an example, a demonstration for perseverance for Christ. Then he says this, chapter 2, verse 6. So then, just as you received Christ, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. All right? Now, at first glance, that feels like a suggestion, but it's not. I want to give it to you in a few translations. Same verse from the ESV, English Standard Version. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him. That feels a little bit more weighty, don't it? It's not up for debate. NLT, New Living Translation. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. This wasn't really mixed up when it was written in Greek. It came across as a command, as an imperative sentence, do this thing. And in English, it's kind of hard because it, it translates over in a way that, do we have to? Yes. Do we have to? Yes. Paul is making the point. You must continue to follow him. Here's, here's the main idea. Paul is making it clear that it's not really up for debate. Yes, yes, yes. Salvation is by faith alone. Absolutely. That's where you say amen. All right, okay, okay, make sure you know. But then that same faith that saves you is intended to then be used to follow him. So right after that, that's, that's how that goes. Right after you get saved, the same faith that saves you is the same faith that's supposed to carry you in following him. It is like step one, step two, st you got it. But I want to be clear. I am not saying and Paul is not saying that salvation requires you to do something. Salvation's not by works. Salvation is by faith alone, and we know that from all over Scripture. So I wanted, I wanted to write this down tonight. Thank you guys for bringing the whiteboard. Here is our picture. Placing your faith in Jesus. Wow, that's a nice marker. We should have let Pastor Tony use this one on Sunday. Can anybody read the board on Sunday? I couldn't. No, no, it's okay. Somebody, I'm praying God lays it on someone's heart to give us new markers. Hallelujah. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Faith equals salvation. Okay? Don't get that mixed up. Faith, you placing your faith in Jesus, salvation. Done. All you do is believe, and Jesus is the one who saves. That's how that works. But now there's something to not be separated but it's not, it doesn't hinge on salvation. Get this. Faith gives us salvation. And then that salvation, I'm just going to write like that, gives us following. Faith brings salvation, but salvation brings following. 
When you give your life to Christ, it is by faith alone. Jesus does the saving. But immediately, you're supposed to start following Jesus. That's how that works. So this is what Paul's trying to make clear. He doesn't leave, leave it to the imagination. And I'll point it out in just a second when we go to verse 7. He doesn't leave this to the imagination whatsoever. He makes it clear. Faith in Jesus and continue after that decision to follow Jesus. Let's read it again and go into verse 7. And now just as you have accepted Christ Jesus as Lord, your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Here's how. Chapter 2, verse 7. Rooted and built up in him. <laughs> Rooted and built up in him. So I, wanna, I want you to use your imagination with me tonight. I, didn't, I thought about bringing two flower pots for an example. But I, I want to give you this example of roots. Rooted and built up in him. Here's the picture. You were born into sin. Sorry. Thank you, Adam, for making that decision for the whole human race. You were born into sin. So over here, we're going to have some, we're going to have a spot where we're all planted. This is where you start. You start by being planted in a place you didn't pick. I'm really sorry, but you're planted in the world in sin. Okay? This is where you begin. And when you accept Christ, don't get confused. Yes, this is, this is what happened. Jesus walked into our world. He walked to where you were planted. He didn't say, come over here. No, he came to where we were, where we are. He comes here and he asks us to come out of the grave, just like Lazarus. He asks us to come out in faith and just follow him. Believe in me and I will save you. So believing in Jesus right here, I'm rooted in sin. And he says, believe in me and I'll save you from it. That's it. Amen. That is amazing. So he came right where we are, and he saves us there. But after that, he intends to change where you are rooted. So he saves you in your sinful roots with the intention to bring you to a new place and root you somewhere else. Your roots are supposed to change. You don't, you're, you're in the world but not of it anymore. So my roots aren't supposed to stay here. I'm still here for a moment. I'm still going to have to live my human life here, but I'm not rooted here. What, is, what else does the scripture say? This is not my home. What else does the scripture say? I am a new creation, not of this world. I'm a co-heir with Christ. Not this world. A different place, a different kingdom. All right, so he intends to change where your roots are, over here. He wants to transplant you, and this is where sanctification happens. This is where spiritual growth happens. This is where the fruits of the Spirit start coming out of your life. And just notice something. Notice that something that just makes good sense. Wherever you're rooted determines your growth. It determines things. It changes things. So that's why so many Christians, and we're going to get back to it in just a second. I just want to explain this. This is why so many Christians they believe in Christ. They believe and they're saved, but they aren't free from their sin. They still feel trapped. Why? They believe all day, but they won't let Jesus change their roots. Does that make sense? So Paul makes it clear. Believe in Jesus and then follow him. Where? To the new flower pot. <laughs> let him change your roots. So I will tell you something. Please let me tell you this. Jesus can raise Lazarus to life all day. But if Lazarus won't walk out of the tomb, let it sink in. John 11, read the story tonight. Jesus spoke a word from outside the tomb and spoke Lazarus back to life because he can do that. He can call you out of darkness. But if you won't leave the tomb, all right, let that sit. Jesus can save you over here, but you can't grow there anymore and expect to look like Jesus. This is what it means to follow Jesus. And he's trying to tell the Colossian church, Paul's writing to the church and explaining that you believe, your faith is strong, yes, but do not compromise on following Jesus. Because if you try to believe in Jesus, you can't follow him over here. You just want to believe and say, thank you, Lord, for saving me, but I'm good here. 
That's not, that's not what Jesus called us to. Yes, faith alone saves with the intention. Faith alone saves, but that salvation is meant to call you out of a tomb, out of the worldly roots, and be rooted in some new things. And I want to explain this for just a second. Well, Pastor Aaron, what do you mean exactly? Give me some real-life examples. Well, you can be rooted in the world standards or in God's standards. Well, where's God's standards? In his word. You can be rooted in the world's standards or in God's standards. Here's some tough ones. Your happiness or his glory. Your needs or his will. Your kingdom or his. This is the changing of roots. This is hard. Or so it seems. It seems hard. We'll talk about it. But he saves you there to enable you by the Spirit to change where you're planted, where you're rooted. And then over here, you can begin to be built up. Built up. You ever seen those people who get saved and it's like less than a year, they're a totally new person? They let God change their roots. It doesn't have to be a year-long, 20-year-long process. I've met people who get saved, and in 60 days, they're further along than some that have been 60 years. Why? They followed Jesus out of that tomb, and they allowed God to build them up in a new location. So let me say it from my country background. You ready? Godly crops don't grow in crappy soil. He just said crap in church. Well, how dare he? Yeah, but you'll never forget the picture. Godly crops don't grow there. They grow in the new place. All the scriptures about, making, about him making us more, molding us into the image of Christ, bringing out the fruits of the Spirit, all of it hinges on whether you let him transplant you. So, verse 7 again. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith. This is cool. This, it, just a second ago, it sounded really hard. Oh my goodness, I bet that's painful. i got to change my roots. I don't know if I can do that. Well, hang on. This, this is where it gets even better. Strengthened in the faith as you were taught. In other words, the same faith, the same faith that brought you salvation is the same faith that is going to help you follow through on your salvation. So I'll explain this really briefly, and it it takes the weight off. This is all Jesus is asking of you. He stepped into our world and said, believe on me, and I will have legal spiritual permission because we sold ourselves into sin. I will have legal spiritual permission under my own blood to snatch you out of this mess if you will call on me. Well, I call on you, Lord. That's great. Now I'm going to take you over here. Oh, man, I still got some roots. I can't. You need to let this stuff go. I don't think I can let it go, God. I don't think I can do it. Believe in me, just like you did back there, and I'll do it for you. Okay, God, I'm trusting you. I don't know how I'm going to survive without this. I don't know how I'm going to survive if I don't don't panic over money every day. I don't know how I'm going to survive if I turn this over to you and not watch it myself. I don't think I can do it. Trust me the way you did with your soul. And watch how roots begin to transfer. This is good news to the person If you don't think you can do it, I got great news. Great news. The same faith that started your journey is the same faith that grows your journey, that changes roots one at a time. If you have placed your faith in Jesus, then you already know what to do. Do it again. (laughs) And again, and again, and again. The same faith that saves you is the same that grows you. Okay, here we go. Back to verse 7. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Understanding what I just said, or what we just learned in the first two stanzas of that verse. Now you know why Paul said overflowing with thankfulness. (laughs) Meaning, you, you can't contain it. Because you understand what just happened in the first two pieces of the verse. I'm, I'm being rerooted and built up, I'm not even the one doing it. All because I believe Jesus is the one who saves, Jesus is the one who transplants, and Jesus is the one who grows me by his spirit. I don't do a thing. Jesus does it. All I do is submit and surrender there, here, and there. That's it. That's amazing. 
And because of this, I understand what Paul was talking about. The more I understand it, I get why he says overflowing with thankfulness. Because, wow, thank you, Jesus. He entered into that life, the sin side, to save us, and and you get the picture now. So with this understanding, Paul goes on to say this, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Now here's what that means. Here's what he means by that. The Colossian people used to live in fear of spiritual powers, and superstitious or not, doesn't matter if it's superstitious or not, they feared these so-called gods. They feared all these Greek and Roman gods. They really did. They were, in, they were in fear of the people who served them. <laughs> they were afraid. And here's, here's the, what Paul's trying to say. Paul says, no, no, <laughs> their philosophies and all their teachings, all those people who worship false gods, it's all based on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces. And whether those are real demonic influences or not, and some of them were, Christ is above them all. So he's easing their minds because they're wanting to follow Christ, but they have some fear. And this is why elsewhere in Scripture it says, Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And this is, Paul's, I, this is where Paul's at, and he's trying to help the Colossians get there. You don't have to be afraid of anybody, even if it is a real demonic thing. Most of it's fake. Most of it's false teaching, just human tradition happening in Colossae. And we got some of that in the world today. But... Some of it is under the influence of real demonic forces. But it doesn't matter. Come what may. Christ is above it all. That's what he's trying to instill in them. This is what happens in verse 9. He gives them this this solid foundation. Listen to this. Verse 9. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. He's literally saying Jesus is God. Jesus is God, the eternal creator of all things. So when he says, in Jesus, the fullness of the deity is there, is present. What he's saying is, don't be afraid of false gods. Don't be afraid of demonic powers. Don't be afraid of what the enemy can do in this world. The end is written. We already know the end. So you don't have to be afraid of whatever happens. You don't have to be afraid of what happens tomorrow in America. You don't have to be afraid of what happens in Palestine with Israel. You don't have to be afraid of what happens in Ukraine. The end is written no matter what happens in between. Christ is Lord. So he's trying to help them see this and feel this. Now watch this. He just said Christ is the fullness of the deity. It's God. Verse 10, he says, and in Christ, in Christ, meaning if you've been saved, if you are in Christ, you believed in him over here in, your, in this mess, you have allowed Jesus to save you, you're good with heaven's records. Listen to this. In Christ, you have been brought to fullness as well. His fullness is your fullness. His righteousness is now your righteousness if you believe in him. So, what does that mean? Well, let's read on. He is the head over every power and authority. And he says this because he's, again, that culture was fearful of world leaders. So, Paul has already, in his monologue, he has dismantled the fear of Greek and Roman gods. And now he is going after the fear of people who worship them or officials, leaders, government. He's going after that. He says, let me go back. He says, uh, He is the head over every power and authority. Even that. He's over all things. Not just the spiritual. I like how David said it in in Psalms. Everything in the earth is the Lord's. Everything. Everything is his. So Paul is easing that that fear. And again, he could come at them in a real stern way. Y'all stop being afraid. Stop. Just knock that off. It ain't godly. But he doesn't do that. He hasn't met them before. He doesn't know how fearful they are. He just knows they're under pressure. So he's writing to them in this way. He's saying, don't be afraid. Resist their pressure. Where you are rooted, nothing in all of creation can come after you when you have those roots changed. So this next part might sound a little weird to us because it talks about circumcision, and I'll tell you why. I want to explain it. Remember that the Colossians, they're being harassed by Greek and Roman God people, And they're being uh, harassed by officials, 
but they're also being harassed by Jews who are trying, they don't want to believe in Jesus. They're trying to force people to go back to the law. So uh, Paul addresses this. He kind of switches gears because, again, he wasn't writing to us. If he was writing to us as a briefing of what he said to them, he would have said, okay, Church of Roanoke, I'm now going to tell you what I said about the Jews. But he doesn't have to do that. They know their problems, and he's writing to them. So he just goes straight into talking about the Jews, and he talks to, about the Jews in a way that the Jews have been sounding all along. So knowing what they're going through, he says this, verse 11, in him, Jesus you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Pause. Old Testament circumcision was a means of removing flesh to signify belonging to God. Okay? Paul says Jesus didn't remove a piece of flesh. He removed the flesh. <laughs> so the Old Testament removing of flesh is just a symbolic representation of what Jesus would do to the flesh. Does that make sense? So just understand, he says, in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh. The flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Anything, and, and he's making the point, anything that you try to require beyond that in terms of circumcision is a straight compromise on what Jesus has already done. So don't compromise on this faith in Jesus. Don't say it's Jesus and circumcision, Jesus and the law, or go the other way, Jesus and works. It's faith alone. Faith alone. Jesus fulfilled the law. Believe in Jesus. So this is the point he makes, and he goes into verse 11. In him you were also circumcised. Oh, sorry, I just read this, and we'll read the back in. Uh, in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Now that's, that's a lot right there. <laughs> that's a lot, but I want to explain it because the Jews are very symbolic people. At Passover meal, you ever, anybody ever been a part of a Passover meal? I have, in like a Jewish Passover meal. And it is very, very symbolic. Very symbolic. And there's a lot of symbolism happening right here. Notice when Paul's talking about the Colossians and people who are uh, Gentiles, non-Jews, everything seems really plain. You know why? We're Gentiles. <laughs> but when he talks about the Jews, they understand this symbolism. Notice how he brings up a list and he just mentioned several things. All of them seem to have a, have a physical and a spiritual counterpart. He brought up circumcision, a physical thing that Jesus will fulfill in a greater way in the spiritual. The removal of the flesh, not a piece of flesh. Now the removal of the flesh is the true symbol of belonging to God. So there's a physical and a spiritual. Baptism. He brings up baptism. That's beautiful. Baptism is a poetic picture of us dying to self and choosing to follow Christ. So when we're water baptized, it's an outward physical display of the moment you said, I'm gonna follow you, Jesus. I'm gonna die to these roots. Please plant me somewhere else. It's being buried in that and leaving that behind. And water baptism is just a physical display of what's happened in the greater way of the spirit. And then he brought up being raised from the dead, Christ being raised from the dead, that's what he said. That's also a beautiful and poetic replica of what happens to you and me when we said yes to Jesus, physical and spiritual. So, verse 13, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, it's all coming together, God made you alive with Christ right there. He didn't ask you to come out first. He came to you. And he forgave us all our sins. Verse 14, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. I mentioned that earlier. Our legal indebtedness, indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. We, God has a right based off of Adam's sin. Pastor Tony talked about that on Sunday. And your own sin, my own sin. We have a legal indebtedness. We can legally, in God's laws of the universe, be punished it is right that we be punished. <laughs> but Jesus took that. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, 
which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away and nailing it to the cross. But wait a minute. It. Who was nailed to the cross? Easy answer. Jesus. Jesus was nailed to the cross, right? But this just said sin was nailed to the cross. Why does it say that? Jesus was nailed. This is just a fun systematic find right here. Why is Jesus nailed to the cross? We know that. But it said right there, Paul says sin was nailed to the cross. Because spiritually speaking, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Did I give you this one? I did. Oh, I gave you the wrong. You have 5.21, 2 Corinthians 5.21? Maybe not. I'll read it to you. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this. God made him who knew no sin to become sin. So that we might become the righteousness of God. Understand the picture that's happening here. He didn't just go and pay your debt by proxy. He actually became what you were so that you could become what he is. That changes how you see him. And it may change why you might start agreeing with Paul, overflowing with thankfulness. He didn't just die in your place, like, yeah, I'll do it. No, he became what you were so you could become what he is. Meaning you were legally indebted to die and he became legally indebted to die. He didn't just pay the price. He became guilty himself so you wouldn't have to. That, what a God. Now, I love this part. Verse 15, because of what he's done, this is a possibility. And having disarmed, <laughs> love that, the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them. Triumphing, triumphing over, the, over them by the cross. And this, my friends, is the God we serve. King Jesus, who can take what was meant to kill him and be the very thing that disarms the enemy of authority in the world. Adam opened the door when he sinned. But Jesus evicted the enemy and shut the door for anybody would be, who would believe. I'm going to say that again. Adam opened the door to the whole world when he sinned. He opened the door to the enemy. Sin is the monster, and the devil's the puppeteer. The devil has no authority. But we sold ourselves into sin, and he puppeteers sin, and we all fall prey, and we all fall, fall, fall to the enemy in this way. But Jesus, under the blood of Jesus, the enemy has been evicted from your life. And he has shut the door. Jesus has shut the door on the enemy. He can't come back into your life. If you believe, can you still fall prey? Can you still be tricked? Yes, but you are no longer bound. Because Romans 8, 1 says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And if that's not enough for you to choose Jesus, I'm not sure you heard me. So I'll just keep going. <laughs> that's enough right there. Paul changes gears a bit. Having explained our spiritual fullness in Christ, he expands on how all those physical things, some of the physical things we just mentioned and others, some of the physical things, both not required by God and some that are required by God, he just shoots them all down. We don't need that stuff anymore. Here's where he goes. It's all completed by Christ. Verse 16, he's making the point, catch this, everything that was physically required of you beforehand from religious leaders, from the law, those were all foreshadows, key word, foreshadows of what Christ would complete. So listen to this. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival or a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are all a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. He completed the law. He paid our debt. He fulfilled all of our religious obligations. And all he asks is for you to believe and be saved and then let him move your roots and follow him. That's it. Believe, follow. That's all he's asking. He did the rest. And matter of fact, he'll help you do that and do that one too. What a God. Sounds too good to be true. All the, prereq all the prereqs that the Jews tried to force on people, fulfilled in Jesus. All the prereqs the church, even today, tries to force on people. Oh no, you gotta, you gotta stop dressing like that before you come to the Lord. You gotta, you gotta, get, that, you gotta get that language taken care of before you come to the no. Fulfilled in Jesus. Somebody may have just gotten saved and they're learning how to let go of some roots by the Spirit and we ought to help them. But don't you dare think you have the authority to put prereqs on people who are in Christ. 
You'll answer for that, just so you know. Verse 18. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Okay, that sounds weird. Explain. Such a person who goes into great detail about what they have seen, they are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. Oh, snap. We need some context. Well, here we go. People in the first century, we've already talked about it a little bit. People in the first century were just fascinated with spiritual beings. Matter of fact, um, even the world knows this. So if you watch movies that have to go way back to these times in history, people were just fascinated with spiritual things and the superstitious type of things. They were just fascinated. So knowing this, people in the first century were fascinated with spiritual beings, some Jews even. They even believed that angels were present during their times of worship, and some even worshipped these angels. You can find that in Jewish history. You can find that in most commentaries. This is what was happening in the first century. And these people were evidently having visions of some sort. And this is, let me pause here. This happened a lot where people in the faith, the Jewish faith, would have a revelation from God. So one of the teachers of the law we have, they had the law of Moses that they're supposed to be following. And one of the teachers of the law would have a revelation from God about how we should do this new thing. It doesn't contradict the law of Moses. It just helps us be more like the law of Moses. So they started adding to all these rules and human regulations of things that needed to happen and things that needed to be kept. There was the actual Torah, then the, the written Torah, and then the oral Torah. <laughs> the stuff that they said you ought to do on top of it. This, this was happening a lot, but... These people, both in the Jewish community and in the Greco-Roman world, they were saying that they were evidently having visions and establishing certain rules as requirements for people to be saved. These people had seen things, the verse said, <laughs> what they had seen. They had seen things and in great detail tried to force it on others, which is ironic because aren't there two big religions in the world today that are based on the same thing? Yeah, there is. Mormonism is exactly like this, exactly like this. They took the New Testament, the New Testament. If you didn't know, they believe in the New Testament. <laughs> they have New Testaments. But then somebody, he, he, he who shall not be named, <laughs> had a revelation, had a revelation in the desert. And he took that revelation and he shared it with everybody and everybody starts following this revelation and it was above and beyond the call of God. He received his information from an angel. We don't have to worry about that. We received our information from God himself. So this is, this is exactly this kind of thing. We're, we're not unfamiliar to this. It was happening in their day. Another world religion has come about this way. Islam. Islam came about the same way. Did you know they fully believe in and endorse Jesus Christ, but not as God? He's mentioned all throughout the Quran. However... Muhammad had a revelation in the mountains next to Mecca, and he came down and he told everybody, here's what has been told to me, and then they went off this revelation. He had a vision from God, apparently. And in the same way, I'm thankful that we didn't have to have a vision. We saw God. He was here, the Son of God. Awesome. So we, we know a little bit about what's going on. We've seen this in our lives and what they're going through. Those types of people in that day were trying to disqualify people. We, we experience this all the time. Mormons would tell you that you're not saved. And so would the people of Islam. We're not saved in this room according to what they say by their revelations. That's what they would tell us. Now, this is happening to them. They're trying to, people are uh, coming in trying to disqualify the believers in Colossian, or Colossae, tell them that they're not saved because they don't believe like the Greco-Roman people or the Jewish people. So Paul says, guys, guys, got that verse up? Yes. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility, <laughs> that's pride, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. This is a huge bomb drop on them. So if you wanted to use this as your sole information to not listen to Mormonism, you got it. Don't listen to anyone who got their information from an angel. <laughs> Period. Don't, they don't get to disqualify you. Don't listen to anyone who worships angels and has a false humility. God made it clear Worship him alone, and he also made it clear elsewhere in Scripture, God opposes the proud. He opposes the proud. So they don't get a voice in your life is what he's trying to say. They don't get a voice in your spiritual status and your journey. This, by the way, is a good measuring stick for false teachers. 
or misguided teachers. Some are not false. They truly believe what they're saying. They're not malicious false teachers. They're just extremely misguided teachers. They'll still answer for it, but man, we need to pray for them. So if they are prideful or have a false sense of humility, be careful. I'll never be one to tell you who, and who to and who not to listen to. I'll just tell you if they're very prideful or have a false sense of humility, the scripture would incline me to say, be careful. If something feels off, it's oftentimes not you. It's the Holy Spirit trying to nudge you. Be careful. If they aren't following God themselves, listen how the, the thing ends. Uh, such a person also goes in great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up about idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have an unspiritual mind. If you know people who don't even follow Christ and they're trying to tell you if you're saved or not, just smile and wave, boys. Just smile and wave. I'm not one to tell you, again, who to listen to. That's the Spirit's job. I can tell you how to get in touch with him, though. Be careful. Verse 19. They have, this is what uh, these types of people are like. Paul says, they have lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. That's a cool point to make. Some may have once been good, but became proud and puffed up. Some may have even been godly at one time, and then it became about them. Some may have been in the faith, and then they decided to leave Jesus. Total apostasy. And that's pretty hard to do, because Jesus, his blood, can cover a multitude of sins. But downright, outright apostasy, I don't want you anymore, Jesus. There's people that have done that. Apostasy. Is what's they just leave the faith. Those people sometimes will even try to be an expert in the faith. And Paul would say, that's prideful, don't listen to them, <laughs> period. If it don't look like Jesus, just say no thank you. Verse 20, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, sin, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? These are some rules you heard from uh, the Torah, the Old Testament. He quotes a few, 21, uh, do not handle do not taste, do not touch, do not do this, do not do this, do not do that. These rules, Paul says, which have to do with these things that are all destined to perish with use, they're based on merely human commands and teachings. This is Paul slamming the Jews. And he's a Jew. He's slamming Jewish law because they had already been fulfilled in Christ. Does that make sense? Okay, three people. You want me to read it again? Did it make sense? All right. You don't want me to read it again, I will. And trying to follow them was a compromise, again, on Christ. And in Paul's mind, it seems like he would equate following Jewish law with cooperating with Greco-Roman gods. He's like, both are a compromise. I don't care if the law brought us Christ. Trying to follow the law is denying Christ. Trying to follow Greco-Roman gods is denying Christ. So either one is equal sin to me. And that's how Paul, and that, oh man, the Jews were upset with Paul. Verse 23. Such regulations, indeed, have an appearance of wisdom. That's important to note. Such regulations, ha indeed, have an appearance of wisdom. Watch out. With their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. There it is. Let me explain. Paul is saying... All the rules that those in the world, those in the world, even those in the church sometimes, would have you keep. Ask yourself this question. Do they actually help you improve and become a better follower of Christ? Hold your answers. The rules and regulations that are being pushed on you, the programs that are being pushed on you, do they actually improve and make you a better follower of Christ? Answer, not usually, maybe superficially. Maybe on the surface, so that the program or the rule can get some glory. But they don't cause a heart change. They don't cause heart change. Why? Because they are rules and regulations formed over here. Human-made programs don't change the heart. Only God can change the heart. So... Let's move, let's move on on this. This, this is a, good, a wonderful point. Man can come up with all kinds of good things that can help. But man can't come up with anything that will fix the heart. Man can't. 
So many good things man can come up with to make us better. But Jesus isn't looking at our definition of good. He's not analyzing your track record. He's looking at your heart. So this, this makes sense. No, there's no reason that we should worry about rules and regulations because they don't change your heart. And Jesus is not looking at your track record. That's under the blood. He's looking at your heart. So you need things that change your heart. And good news, he has a name. Jesus is looking at your heart, so the question becomes, is your man-made mechanism of not sinning really doing anything in here? I know people that come up with mechanisms and, and ways to help themselves to be better for Jesus. Maybe I should say it like this. To the non-married, just because you're abstinent for a season doesn't mean things got healed in here. That is heavy. How about this one? Just because a program got you clean by the world standards, maybe even for a good while, doesn't mean you are clean in here. Just because things have changed on the outside superficially doesn't mean things have been changed to your core. Think about a plant. I know that a plant will only produce fruit based off where it, what kind of plant it is. But you know, some people are so good at keeping their, their plant pruned, no one can tell what their fruit is. <laughs> that is a very real statement. I'm just going to let it sink in. Say it again. Some people live with roots in the world, roots in sin, secret things that they have not let God take out of their life. And they're so good at keeping themselves pruned, nobody can tell because the fruit hasn't came out. <laughs> it's heavy. Anyway, I'm going to move on. It's funny, though, how it comes back to roots, isn't it? And notice how Paul brings it up early on in the chapter because the rest flows from it. What's that scripture in Proverbs? I think I gave it to him. Did I give it to you? Let's see. I did. Above all else, guard your heart. Why? For everything you do flows from it. Everything you do flows from it. And question, pop quiz, what's the best way to guard your heart? Answer, stop trying to do it yourself. Get rooted in the right place and let the Holy Spirit, who was destined to do it, he will do it. Let him change your roots. All right. Man, we are right on time. Moving into chapter 3, that wraps up the, the third subsection of the letter. We just finished chapter 2. Paul has dealt with the Messiah. He, Jesus is king. Jesus is Messiah. And I suffer, section 2, I suffer for that God, that God, man, Jesus, who did everything for me. And let me tell you, don't give in to the pressures of this world. Don't you, don't you compromise on Jesus because he did not compromise on you. That's his message. And now the last two chapters are all about, and this is fantastic, the resurrected life. It's all about living for Jesus in the resurrected life. What does that look like? It's amazing. The resurrection life, chapters 3 and 4, let's do it. Chapter 3, verse 1. I warn you, this is my favorite part, and it is heavy. Favorite part of Colossians for me. Well, probably the bit about Jesus in chapter 1 and then this. Chapter 3, verse 1. Since then, meaning understanding everything else I've said, now we can talk about this. You have been raised with Christ. <laughs> Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. I want to read those two verses again, and then I want to explain them. Just ask God to give you ears to hear this. Close your eyes if you have to and just listen. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Jesus, help us as we go into this next section because it's tough. It's hard. This is, these are sections about walking in the resurrected life, post-moving uh, post of the roots, when you've moved us, we've allowed you to save us, and you've, we've allowed you to move us into this new life. Help us in this. Amen. He says, set your mind. Fix your thoughts in the right place. In the right place. Not the world, in God. Not your kingdom, his. 
Not your priorities, priorities, his. Not your happiness, his will. His des- not your desires, his. Set your mind, your thoughts in the right place, not some worldly place. Don't let this life have your, listen to this word, big picture focus. This world is not supposed to have your big picture focus. Yes, it's true. We're going to be here for a few decades. Some of us longer than others, some of us shorter than others. But we're placed here for just a short amount of time. You are going to be here, but be sure, be assured, everything here will pass away. Everything here will pass away. This beautiful building that we take care of and the beautiful stained glass window, everything that we have will pass away. You will pass away. All of it will pass away. And I just want to give you this good news tonight. Great news. Bills will pass away. (laughs) So let me give you some good spiritual wisdom. Stop panicking. Stop acting like God isn't provider and that the big picture is that you think the big picture is that the bills are paid? We have to be frugal. Yes, I'm not saying we have permission to splurge and be bad stewards. No, be a good steward. But God gives you permission to stop acting like those things follow you where you're going. They don't follow you. Stop panicking over bills. Come what may, it doesn't change what is going to happen. Health issues, not a thing in eternity. Why do they have your focus? Set your mind on things above. Yes, I go through this for right now. Yes, I have to deal with this, and I may have to deal with it for 50 or 60 years, but it doesn't have to happen anymore in eternity. That's setting your mind on things above. This is over. Um, Pain and suffering, finished in the name of Jesus. Struggle, you won't struggle with sin or anything anymore. Death, something that the believer is exempt from. No, we're not. Well, kind of. Let me explain. Don't you dare mourn for me when I die. I'm just asleep, and I'm going to wake up real soon. And I, and I actually pray that I die before Jesus comes back. Why? Because it says the dead in Christ go first, and I want to go before all y'all. I want to be first. I'll be like, gotcha. I, I want to be with Jesus. And when we get there, when we get there, all of these things that we hyper-focus on in the world are done away with, all the negative things. But you know what's also true, and I just set you up so bad to step on your toes. You know what also is true about that statement, set your mind on things above? Your bank account. Not a thing in eternity. So stop making it your focus. How about this one? Your possessions. All of it passes away, remember? So why, does, why do they get more attention than Jesus? Oh, my goodness. Set, this is what it looks like to live the resurrected life. Set your mind on things above. How about this one? And this is the epitome of all the ones we could do. Your time. The clock down here is ticking, but the clock in eternity is frozen. And we do one thing. We're with Jesus. The clock in eternity is frozen. We are with Jesus. And yet, some of us only think about him when someone else brings him up. Set your mind on things above, child of God. And if you haven't done that, it's probably because you still got some roots. I'm not saying you're fully rooted over there. Sometimes sanctification, no, all the time. Sometimes it's faster than others, but all the time, sanctification is a process. The moving of roots. It's a great picture. But God transforms you by the renewing of your mind. He has brought you to life. And he says, can I save you? Yes, please. Can can I change you? Yes, please. That's your only contribution. (laughs) Yes, please. And he moves you one root at a time or as many as you'll let him have. And then you might wake up one day and realize you're putting something before God. That's because you've got most of your roots in one bucket and one in another. And you feel so strained in your soul because you weren't meant to be in a tension match. Ouch. When we put these things, when we have our minds set on worldly things, Paul just simply says, listen, I'm not going to debate with you. Set your mind on things above. Set your mind on things above. Now, what did the first verse, first verse say? Who is above? Jesus. Go back to the first verse if you don't mind. Chapter 3, verse 1. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Notice it says hearts. 
hearts on things above, where Christ is. So set your heart on that. Now, next verse. Set your mind there too. Set your heart there, meaning let that be the core of who you are, but then set your mind there, meaning that's where you're going. That's your goal. That's your pursuit. It, this is what you think about. This is your big picture focus. Yes, we have to be good stewards. Yes, we have to manage what God has given us. Yes, we have to disciple our children. Yes, we have to deal with life's problems. I found out I had to put tires on my car today. So I did, and I had to deal with that. And we're going to have to deal with that. That's how it's going to be. But you know what? Sydney said, oh my goodness, but didn't we just pay off this and we didn't know that we needed, we're going to have to pull from savings. I said, you know what? We are. And when I talked to her about this sermon already, and she's, or this message already, and she said, our mind isn't set here though, is it? No, it's not. We work for God, so he's going to pay for them tires. <laughs> Woo, Jesus, I love you. Oh man, it's awesome. Learn from Peter. Learn from Peter when he walked on water and he sank. What happened? He took his eyes off Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Yes, we have to deal with some things this side of eternity while we're here. Yes, we have to be frugal, good stewards. But my friend, my friend, hear me. Struggle well. Struggle well. You will struggle. So my advice to you is struggle well because it won't be long. Struggle well because it won't be long. Fix your heart and your mind on Jesus. It won't be long until it's all under his feet in a millennial kingdom that will last forever. Wow. Verse 3. For you, this is hard. For you died. Okay. <laughs> For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Let me explain. We'll probably stop after this verse because it's heavy. For you died, we need to grasp this. Take a step back, at least. If you haven't read it in a while, or you haven't thought about it in a while, or maybe you've never thought about it before, receive this tonight. When you accepted Christ, it's supposed to be as if you died. This was the picture. Deny yourself, follow him, pick up your cross. This is what Jesus said, Luke 9, 23. This is, this is faith saves you but with the intention to then start following Jesus. Faith, he saves you here, and then by that same faith says, now please, come with me, we're not staying in this mess. This is, this is the, the progression that he's searching for, for you and me. For you died. Following Jesus means not following you. I want to explain this. Following Jesus means not following you. So in essence, it should be something like this. Hey, where did Aaron go? Where did, where did the Aaron I used to know go? Like, I, you're not the same anymore. Where did, what happened to you? I don't even recognize this guy. And my response is, yeah, that guy died. <laughs> They're like, but you're standing right in front of me. Yeah, but everything that I was isn't anymore. So it's kind of like he died. Well, how is that? Because I'm following Jesus. So you just became something new? No, I was made something new. I didn't become anything. He did it. They're like, I don't understand. Well, I can tell you about salvation, and then you will understand. Because I can't explain it. All I can tell you is that Jesus saved me. And he said, follow me. And I said, yes, please. And as I started following Jesus, I became the new creation that he's talking about. Yes, I'm following Jesus. I am covered, and I am hidden in him, it says. Let me read that again. Verse, uh, verse 3. For you died when we live for Christ, it should be in such a way that people, if you don't see somebody for a year, they come back and say, you're different. Or they stay saying, maybe even in a derogatory way. I've had friends say this to me before, and I'm not boasting in myself at all. I've had pe people say this to me, and people that are close to me, uh, that I've got to witness it, and it's such a joy to witness in some of your friends' lives, by the way. They go to places they used to go, and somebody says, man, you're different. You are so different. What, what happened to you? And it sounds derogatory, but that's the best compliment you've ever had in your life. Because somebody noticed that you're not the you they know. <laughs> that's the best thing you could ever hear in your life. Don't let it discourage you. Make it, make it a moment where you just bow your head and smile. And you go, you're right. I'm not. 
And they're like, well, and then you get a chance to explain. That's an opportunity, and I'm hoping, I'm praying that one of you in this room gets this opportunity this week. Someone says, you know, man, you're different than you were like just five years ago. You're different than you were in college. You're different than you were. And some people are like, yeah, well, I had to grow up sometime. No, that's not the answer if you're in Christ. (laughs) Some people do grow up, but they keep their same things. I didn't grow up. I'm still not grown up. I'm like 27. I'm just a kid. I'm just a kid. I didn't just grow up. I received Christ and he changed me. I am not a grown version of what I used to be. I'm not what I used to be. And I'm becoming something that I can't make myself into, only Christ. Wow. I'm following Jesus. Why don't you stand to your feet tonight? We'll pick up in verse 4 next week. Actually, I'm going to read it to you as you're standing. Go ahead and stand. Verse 4. I love this. For you died. In verse 4 it says, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Aaron died. I'm following Jesus. Jesus is my life. And one day when he appears at the second coming of Christ, we will be with him. Why? Because we went in the rapture. How? We attended the marriage supper of the Lamb. And our unity with the groom is finally made whole. And when he comes riding on the clouds of glory, guess who's with him? The bride. The church. Wow. See all the connections? How Revelation is just now coming together. Everything's just coming together now, isn't it? It all makes sense. So tonight, let's pray and thank God for all that he's done. And then ask for strength. Some of us need some root changes. Amen? Some of us need to let God change some roots. <sighs> Help us with that, God. And some of us who have had root changes, or we think we have, our mind and our, our, hopefully our hearts are set on things above, but sometimes our minds can get swayed to things of this world. When you don't have enough money, you start really thinking about money. When you don't have enough peace because life is hectic and stressful, you start really thinking about how hard life is and you start hyper-focusing on this world or your pain or your suffering. Big picture focus, people. The big picture is, yes, you'll struggle, but only for a little while. Jesus, tonight we come before you as humble humble people of God. We know what you did. You came into the world and saved us right where we are. Woo! You saved us right where we are, and you invited us into a life of following you, which is sanctification, moving of roots from one place to another. And Holy Spirit, thank you for helping me in this way. I pray, God, as we leave here tonight, you identify in our souls. No, I pray right now you identify in your saints. Holy Spirit, identify this in your people. Help them to know in their hearts where their roots are not moved yet. Show it to them, God. Show me tonight where roots need moved. I pray they're praying for themselves right now. Pray for yourselves, church. Show me, God. Show me where things need to move. And Holy Spirit, move them. I relinquish control in the same way I relinquished my soul. I give it to you. And now, God, in the changing, in the shift of those heartstrings, those heart roots, it's real easy, even on the other side, when we're not anything in the world anymore, sometimes it's real easy, God, to focus on things in this world. Sometimes we get focused on things that are of the world, worldly matters, and don't let us do that. Maybe our focus, our primary focus just needs to expand. I pray for an expansion of focus tonight, a bird's eye view on the situation that this life is but a vapor. And it will all pass away, but your words will never pass away. And you said that you're coming back for me. So, Holy Spirit, thank you for your help in this. Jesus, thank you for saving me. And God, thank you for being in control of it all. I give you all the honor and glory and praise tonight. And everybody says, amen. Amen. I will see you Sunday.